The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Social media may just be the biggest megaphone out there, and convoy protesters have used it well. We'll explore how tonight. Then from our Ontario hubs, why people living with disabilities aren't so sure about the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions. And from how to end the Ottawa occupation to celebrating black joy, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, February 18th, and that's ahead on the Agenda. Well before the first rig rolled into Ottawa or up to the U.S. border, social media was blaring messages and calls to action. And once the protesters were entrenched, citizens took to the platforms to react. With us now on how Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a few you may not have heard of are amplifying diverse voices. Carmen Celestini, a postdoctoral fellow at Simon Fraser University's The Disinformation Project and an instructor at the University of Waterloo. And in the nation's capital, lawyer and political commentator, Karim Assad, who's been tweeting from the thick of the occupation in Ottawa. Hi to you both. Hi. Hi. So, you know, this convoy began as a protest. It's now been called an occupation. Uh, Carmen, how closely have you been following everything that's been happening? Well, I've been really engaging with the social media, the alternative social media, um, throughout the pandemic and sort of watched this thing roll together and come together as an offline event. So we could see that there was a rise in conspiracy theories, a rise in disinformation throughout the pandemic. And we could also see populism and politics being involved in this, with some campaigns using their entire platform being the anti-COVID movement, anti-mandate movement. So we've seen this all come together, and I sort of expected that there would be a, a rise up at some point, and the convoy was definitely what it is. When you say alternative, what do you mean? Well, most of the conversations happen on Telegram or on BitChute or Odyssey, which are platforms very similar to YouTube. But Telegram is a um, enhanced chat forum where they have groups. So there's been groups that have been specifically talking about anti-mandates, anti-COVID measures, and linking those to conspiracy theories such as the Great Reset, um, the Blue Beam Project. So they link Justin Trudeau directly to these conspiracy theories. So the rise up in the vitriol that we're seeing against the prime minister really has been a momentum for the last few months. Um, and uh, Karima, you've been online and you've actually been on the ground in Ottawa. How would you characterize what it is that you're seeing? I mean, I would echo some of what um, was just said, that there are many conspiracy theories that are sort of floating in the same pool and people borrowing ideas from one another. And it, it is a very strong anti-Trudeau sentiment. Um, I think that sort of the goalpost of vaccine mandates is one that is clung to as being the purpose for the protest, um, but scratching even a little bit beneath that surface. And it becomes quite apparent that it, you know, mandates are, are not the primary reason I think that we are seeing this this type of action on the ground. And you've been, I've been following you on Twitter throughout the pandemic, um, and you've been following these different movements throughout the past two years. And I, throughout the past, uh, I guess, three weeks now, uh, I've seen the conversation become a bit more, um, I guess I would say kind of more hostile towards you. Um, some people have called you polarizing. Some people have said that, have you accused you of being uh, a grifter? Why are you on the ground documenting what's happening? And do you feel like you're misunderstood? I think that this is an extension of the work that I have been doing for over a year now. And, you know, I'm not too concerned um, with that type of reception. Um, you know, it's unfortunate to have one's motives impugned. Uh, I know that the reason I'm here is because I'm deeply concerned about what type of Trojan horse this movement represents and what seems to me a surge toward 
right-wing populism, white nationalism, I find that those trends are deeply concerning and that a lot of people who are partaking in this are unaware or willfully blind to those connections. And so I think that this is important work. Um, I know from experience and just talking to people that there are a lot of divisions within families um, that have emerged over the past two years rooted in one family member, multiple family members going down these rabbit holes. And so, you know, I think that understanding what is happening here is going to be crucial if we have any hope of whether it's reconciling or figuring out a way to coexist post pandemic. And as far as being a grifter, I don't have the benefit of a media company behind me. Uh, my work has been entirely self-funded uh, and now crowdfunded to some extent. And I, I think that my work has value. It's been sort of influential, I think, in shaping media narratives. Um, the images and videos I've shot have been shared around the world. And it it's not altogether surprising to me that people want to devalue the work of a brown woman. Oh, so let's talk about that, because um, we are going to talk about trust and the media. So do you think do you think that the media has not done what it is that you do you're doing? I think that the media has had difficulty in covering this in, in the way that it should. And, and possibly some of that stems with uh, an inherent instinct to want to showcase both sides of whatever in, in an equal fashion. And I don't think you can do that where one side is acting in bad faith or based on lies or delusions. And so I have a bit more flexibility in the way, especially that I use Twitter and I try to take sort of a humorous approach um, to what it is that I do, looking for the levity in what's otherwise a bleak situation. Um, you know, I'm also not beholden to any interests outside of myself, which is a luxury, I think, that a lot of journalists don't have. Um, Carmen, Karima spoke of the divisions uh, in many families across the country. Our premier spoke of the divisions within his own family. Uh, a lot of us have, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this was a surprising thing to happen in Canada. Was this surprising to you? Not at all. Um, what we've seen is that right-wing extremists and white nationalists have actually been using political memes to spread their ideology. They use humor, they use different ideas, and they've linked themselves to the COVID anti-COVID protests and the anti-mask protests that we've seen throughout the pandemic. Most of the conspiracy theories and disinformation that is being spread is actually done through these type of discussions and memes attached to political ideas. So it's not that people do not understand what's going on, they're actually being manipulated in many ways. And so this division that is being sown is that they're being reinforced by what they call experts. So there are doctors out there who are anti-mandates and anti-vaccines. They have PhDs and other experts and other media formats that are discussing these topics and reinforcing these ideas. So when you're in sort of a bubble and you are on, in Telegram, most definitely a bubble, it's linked together. So what we see is like this hierarchy. So it's conspiracy theories that would normally not be linked together are now linked together in this hierarchical idea. All of it is linked to politics, ideas of racism, the spreading of ideologies, and it becomes their media focus. So when we see legacy media, there's a definite distrust in the legacy media. We can't have conspiracy theories take hold if there isn't a distrust in the institutions of society. So we have to show both sides of this in the media because it is completely to our own harm not to engage in these conversations. We see what conspiracy theories, disinformation, and these alternative platforms can provide and motivate, and they understand themselves as being social heroes, which means they're on a mission to save Canada. They're on a mission to save us. And in that recognition, they know they will be ostracized. They'll lose their family, they'll lose their friends, they'll be called names. So when we talk about them being a fringe minority, they adopt that title 
because it validates their mission and validates the importance of what they're doing to save us. So it's expected when families get mad at each other and separate because of these rabbit holes, they go down. Why now? Well, because of the pandemic, most of us ended up being segregated. We were separated from our friends and our normal social groups, and we turned to social media. So what we saw on social media were people engaging on mainstream platforms like Twitter and Facebook. But then we started hearing ideas about shadow banning, about censorship, and you know when Parler was taken down, people started moving and migrating as people were deplatformed or as people started making these calls about censorship. Once they got to Telegram and to other what they call free speech uh, alternative media, there is little to no moderation there. So they can talk about anything, and they do. And once they got there, it started opening up the, the um, envelope. When you're scared, which many people were during the pandemic, they were, you know, can I pay for my rent? Can I pay for my food? What's going to happen with my career? And it was a perpetual sense of disaster. And when that happens, you look for an answer. And you look, if you turn to religion, your God may not provide the answer. So you start looking for a human-made cause for this. And conspiracy theories and disinformation and blaming um, ethnic groups or ethnicities or races can provide that answer. And during a political campaign as well, we could see that that rhetoric was being reinforced in some of the policies and some of the ideas on platforms. So it bubbled up because everything happened at once and it hasn't had a ceasing. There hasn't been an end to the mandates or the end to this disaster. There's always another virus or another um, concern that's coming out. So it blew up. And at this point, these ideas of um, the government not representing them gave an opportunity for the organizations that were leading this to think about the dismantling of our democracy, but hinging it on the ideas of mandates or the ideas of conspiracy theories. We also saw them articulating conspiracy theories and really, really reinforcing the fear. So it bubbled up to the point that we now have this conviction of individuals to save Canada from tyranny. A lot of people, as you both mentioned, are finding community on social media in these alternative so-called spaces. The Edelman Trust Barometer for 2022 came out earlier this week. And on distrust in Canadian societal leadership, the numbers are not so great in the category of journalism. 61% of people worry that journalists and reporters are purposely misleading them. 60% think they're being led astray by business leaders. And 58% of people believe that government leaders Leaders are saying false things or exaggerating them. Uh, Karima, how are you seeing this distrust in this institutions reflected in the Ottawa crowd? I think, I mean, the most obvious is in, in some of the signage and the slogans being chanted, um, this idea of fake news and, you know, the even, even where someone is responding to developments in the situation and, and announcements from the government about a state of emergency or what have you, um, there's, you know, distrust about what that even means and how to interpret that and whether it's real. Um, so we're, we're operating on different planes of reality to some extent. And, you know, I don't think that the pandemic is entirely to blame for this, but certainly it accelerated the problem. And we now have, you know, this this absolute erosion of, of trust. And what does that mean going forward post pandemic, if we reach that point? Um, you know, how, how does that get rebuilt? If not the pandemic, what do you think uh, built, uh, built us to the situation? Brought us to the situation? I think, I, I mean, I think that there, you know, for the past few decades, um, People have seen sort of politicians act with what they view as impunity. We've seen a degradation of civil discourse, political discourse. I think that circumstances have gotten, like material circumstances, have gotten worse for some people. Um, and, and there's this idea that the people who are supposed to be looking out for us don't have our best interest in mind. Um, and, and I think that that just crystallized during the pandemic, but even sort of setting that aside, um, you know, we, we've seen other kind of right-wing populist movements um, or left-wing populist movements take seed um, precisely because 
uh, people feel that the institutions are not playing the role that they are supposed to. Um, I wanted to take a look at some images from these uh, protests or occupations. Uh, uh, let's show some photos from Ottawa, in particular, of the Canadian flag. Uh, in the first photo, the Canadian flag flies upside down on the Terry Fox statue near Parliament Hill. A sign attached to the statue says, Mandate Freedom. In the second one, a protester walks by a F.U. Trudeau sign with an upside-down flag. In the last photo, a Canadian flag is flown alongside a flag with a swastika. Um, the last image is very uh, distressing for a lot of people. And it's I, a lot of people think have been surprised to see that because if this is about mandates, why are swastikas at this um, uh, these protests? Carmen, if you can explain to us what these images mean, what does the upside down flag indicate to people who do see it online on YouTube streams or in news reports? Well, an upside down flag um, means that the country is in distress. It's a sign of distress. And they are articulating that they feel that the government has been either become autocratic or that the country itself is um, in danger from a one world government. Most people are articulating that. They feel that Having that flag upside down is telling the world that the country is in trouble and they're out to fight for it. Now, when we see the flag hanging like this, it's also symbolic for the social movement itself. We have to understand that within these conspiracy theories and the populism that we see attached to it is a notion of nationalism. So it's a definition of our borders and protecting ourselves. And so when they use the flag, it's a rallying call that they are the heroes to save Canada. Within the lore of the conspiracy theories of COVID that we're seeing right now is that the one world government is using Canada, Australia, and New Zealand as their testing grounds. So if they can actually enslave our testing people ground for what? over the testing ground for a one world order for the entire planet. Um, so they feel that we are that testing ground. And so if they don't rise up and stop this, they're not only saving Canada, they're saving the world. So that's why we see our flag rise, rise posted in Australia and New Zealand, because we're representative of the front force fighting against this. So the flag itself being put beside the Gadsden flag and beside the swastika is because there are representatives from right wing extremists and um, white nationalist groups who are part of this. As we said earlier, they've been engaging in these conspiracy theories. At one point in my research, um, a group called White Lives Matters was doing a protest across North America, Toronto being the only place in Canada. They actually reached out to the anti-mandate and anti-mask protesters that we saw every weekend and tried to coordinate that effort. They spoke in their group on Telegram about not talking about the racist ideology obviously motivating them, but more of how to save and how to interact together. And so we see that reaching out and it would only make sense that they would be there representing it. We also see some of the people who have been engaged as the leaders also engaged in some of these white, right wing extremist groups and white nationalist groups as well. So that articulation in that marriage is there. And while jarring to Canadians, as we see ourselves more as the peacekeepers and we don't hang flags on our doorsteps as much as our neighbors to the south, um, it's something that we do hold um, with pride. And now we're seeing it being um, desecrated and, and representing something that does not represent everyone. And there is some flowback against that. Um, it was Flag Day earlier in the week, and it was barely acknowledged by anyone. And we see people on social media talking about it not being who we are as a nation. But throughout the pandemic, we've had to wrestle with ideas of what happened at the residential schools, the graveyards that, we, that were found. And we've had to articulate and think about who we are as a nation and think about how we articulate and what we need to do to correct and what our capacity are for, or for harm. And here we see this question now arising with the Gadsden flag beside it, with the swastika being emblazoned on the Canadian flag. So it's really a moment for us as a nation to try and understand who we are as a people and to fight back against this 
articulation of who we are through these convoys and these images. Karima, Carmen mentioned earlier that um, for media should be including these voices in the conversation. Um, but we've seen a lot of pushback against the mainstream media saying, you know, you shouldn't be platforming certain voices. But what is the danger in protesters only sharing through social media channels their own message? I mean, I think they land up in an echo chamber and the the danger there is ideas that are quite abnormal and not logical become normalized and spread amongst each other and it, it is this snowball effect of bad and dangerous ideas taking root. Um, so while, you know, and, and it's it's, I don't think any of us have the actual solution to this. In my own work, um, I, I do try to have some level of engagement and obviously I get to sort of pick and choose what uh, what's actually utilized, but segment of society to its own devices when we already know that they are susceptible um, to sharing, spreading misinformation, disinformation that has real world impacts, I think contributes to isolation. And so wherever possible, we should be looking for opportunities to build bridges, really. Um, Carmen, you know, where would you put this protest in context of what you've been tracking online over the years in the US, Canada and around the world? Um, I would say that we are seeing an articulation very similar to what we saw with January 6th. So throughout the um, administrative term of President Trump, there was still that um, mixing of right-wing extremism, deep conspiracy theories with QAnon. And there are no borders when we're engaging on social media such as Telegram or BitChute or Odyssey. And so many of those ideas, as we can see here, the flag with Donald Trump one rising up in Ottawa and in Toronto at the protests is that these become ingrained in many people's ideas and understanding of the world. So it's not something that is unique, but I think it takes a lot of people um, at shock. People are um, unsure of what's happening and why this is here is because they aren't participating in those social media. They aren't part of sort of that expected norm within these groups. So as there is an echo chamber, we also see uh, an, an accepted value system within the conspiracy theories and within the right wing extremism. And that ends up being literal. It ends up being a change to the discourse outside of social media. So we could see it in our own political elections where there was more name calling. There was more sort of sense of anger within the platform and a less amount of discourse. And that fundamentally is the problem in these echo chambers that we're creating that rise up to be protests because it ingrains in this idea of social media where you know there are influencers who engage you, who mobilize you behind your fears or through certain slogans. And then you are called to rise up and fight against this tyranny. And so we can see it happening and it behooves us to engage with it and to understand it. Or we could be in situations where we are now with this occupation or what happened on January 6th. Karima, I was uh, I, I saw an interview that Pat King, one of the leaders of the convoy, gave, and the interview was very compelling. But I also know there's there's been also interviews that he's given that were maybe not so compelling. Media is entrusted, and the government is entrusted, as we saw in the Edelman Barometer Trust. Um, from what you've seen, what is the media doing that it shouldn't be doing? I think, I, I mean, to answer your question maybe a bit differently, I think what is required is a forceful denunciation of views that are, I, I say harmful, but, you know, of views that espouse, uh, in particular, white nationalism uh, or fascism. And, and I think that contextualizing people and the, the various prominent figures in this movement against their past actions and their current behaviors that maybe aren't broadcast when facing up against mainstream media. I think that that needs to be done and, and it needs to be done uh, consistently. Why? Otherwise, um, 
there's, you know, maybe a tendency for for people who do rise um, to prominence, whether they are charismatic, whether they are well spoken, sometimes they're neither, but have an ability to put on a different face. Um, and you know, I, I am not one. To, I, I can't diagnose why it is that people are able to do that, um, but. It, you know, we talk about folks being manipulated if they only see the heroic martyr freedom fighter and they don't understand that this individual has a history of xenophobia, of Holocaust denialism, so on and so forth. Uh, very easy to follow along. Uh, and and again, that, that becomes, I think, a, a path that we don't want to, to tread. Carmen and Karima, thank you so much for um, giving us your insights. We really do appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, take good care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The province announced this week that as of March 1st, vaccine passports would no longer be required. As well, effective today, many capacity limits were lifted. While this may be great news to some, it struck fear in the hearts of others. For one, our Ontario Hubs editor, Sarah Trick, who joins us now from the nation's capital. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Jan. All right, so for your op-ed for TVO.org, you wrote that you're more scared now than you have been at any time since the pandemic started. I'm hoping you can unpack that for us a little bit. What is your main concern? Okay, so I was being um, perhaps a little bit hyperbolic to make a point. Um, I do stand by my statement. I, I do want to make clear that the reason that I am scared right now for myself is not necessarily the virus. Um, I've had all three of my shots. There's no reason for me to believe that the vaccine did not work in my case. Um, even though I'm high risk, I have every expectation of coming through COVID-19 okay. What frightens me is a society that seems to have rendered disabled people and immunocompromised people and children acceptable losses for getting back to normal. And what frightens me is that many people will not be included in this normal. And people that I would have thought were compassionate and caring seem to find this okay. That's what scares me. I think a lot of this has to do with sort of this narrative in this potentially last wave that Omicron is mild. And in your op-ed, you had mentioned that that narrative is problematic. Can you explain that a little bit? Okay, so first of all, we are lucky in the Omicron is, or does appear to be milder than Delta so far. Um, however, the sheer infectivity of this variant means that there is, as everybody has seen, a, a higher absolute number of cases, but also a higher absolute number of deaths. Um, during the peak of the Omicron wave, Canada reported approximately 170 deaths per week. During the peak of the Delta wave, which is the more deadly variant, the peak was 50. So even though Omicron does seem to be milder as a proportion of like the amount of cases infected. Um, the number of deaths is the same or higher. Um, as well, the infectivity of it means that a lot of the precautions that we took um, aren't necessarily working as well. Um, it is more common to be infected now. Vaccine effectiveness has declined, although not um, it hasn't gone away entirely, which is really fortunate. Um, but the but the thing that worries me about this narrative is, um, I, I don't know if you remember, but a, a month or so back, or a couple months or, month or so, um, the CDC director in the United States, um, Rochelle Walensky, came under fire for um, a certain quote that she made in the media. And what she said was um, something like, the people that are dying are the ones that had four more comorbidities comorbidities, and this part is the direct quote, so really these are people who are unwell to begin with. It was said that she was taken out of context because she was quoting um, a study that was relating to vaccine effectiveness, and that study showed that most people who are fully vaccinated were not going to get severe, de severe disease and death. But um, if you look at the CDC's actual list of comorbidities, it is very easy to get to four um, comorbidities. So a comorbidity could be a thing like high blood pressure, um, having ever smoked, um, diabetes, asthma. It's not just 
serious things or, or more serious things such as being having received an organ transplant um it's very easy to get into one of those groups these are not all severely ill people who are on their deathbeds and i worry that a lot of the framing around the omicron is mild narrative contributes to that perception which is inaccurate i, I want to talk about a, another sort of problematic phrase uh that you brought up in your op-ed which was protect the vulnerable which was sort of this phrase that was brought up quite early in the pandemic as a way to get people involved in getting their vaccines uh and, and such what's wrong with that so protect the vulnerable has always been an interesting phrase. Um, it's been used a lot in different disability-related discourses before the pandemic. Um, what it does and what it has done here is it renders the vulnerable as a group of people who are outside society. And we saw that evolution throughout the pandemic. So in the beginning of um, the pandemic, the framing was we need to protect the vulnerable um, by social distancing, by isolating, by doing all of these things. Um, the vulnerable were not part of we. As the pandemic moved along, you got more and more messages such as, we need to protect the vulnerable so that the rest of us can get on with our lives. And so that segregates the vulnerable from civic participation, from life. Now, as I say in my column, people still say we need to protect the vulnerable, but I haven't seen any policy objectives that will actually go ahead and do that. It seems to be more of a token phrasing that politicians use when they admit that they don't actually have any plan for doing so. And that is extremely disheartening and discouraging. So you were talking about policy. I want to talk about uh, what measures government or community can take to help those who are most affected by the elimination of vaccine passports and mask wearing. Well, I would say, and I did say in this column, that the vaccine passports were a flawed tool. Uh, they did require two doses. Um, in order to be effective at this point, you'd have to probably move to a three-dose model, and there are good reasons not to do that. Um, what they did do, though, is that they did provide dis disabled people, vulnerable people, anyone who might be frightened to go out, some sort of assurance that going out would be a little bit more safe. And with with their end, um, people don't have that anymore. If mask mandates are dropped, that's going to be even worse. So um, as far as policy goes, I, I would say if you're going to say that vulnerable people need to protect ourselves, we need to be given the tools to do that. One way that I could see doing that is to provide N95 quality masks to people on social assistance who will not be able to afford these masks. Um, an adult on um, the Ontario Disability Support Pro Program receives $1,169 per month. Um, they already cannot pay for regular costs such as food and rent. They're not going to be able to buy their own extremely expensive masks. We could have targeted test testing um, programs where people who have disabilities could receive um, a certain number of rapid tests. If people can't go to grocery stores to get these tests, which I do think was a good program, um, they're not going to benefit anyone. So you really need to get the protections to the people that need them. Now, Sarah, you live close to the trucker occupation in Ottawa, which is in its third week. How has that affected your life lately? I'm lucky in that I'm a little bit isolated from center town, like where the actual, where the vast majority of the trucker protests have happened. Um, I have heard a little bit of the noise. Um, the way that it's affected my life mostly is seeing um, the fear in those who work with me, um, such as personal care attendants when they want to come in and um, you know help me with my care, for example. Um, so one time a person didn't want to come in for their shift because she said that a friend of hers had been threatened for wearing a mask. Um, people don't feel that it's safe to take the bus. Um, so a lot of people are not receiving the services that they need right now, or they're not receiving them in a timely manner. Sarah, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight. Of course, your article can be read on tvo.org. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
The agenda this week assessed whether the post-pandemic workplace needs fewer managers, celebrated black joy, and explored pandemic effects on body image. The agenda's week in review begins with what's needed to end the Ottawa occupation and the international dimensions of those protests. I wonder if one of the things that we've learned from both January 6th of last year in the United States and, and now in Ottawa is that a very small handful of people can actually apparently give the impression that democracies are being brought down to their knees and are incapable of making decisions. Do you think that's a takeaway from all this? Yeah, I, you know, here's the trap, Steve, um, for governments. Uh, there's, it, it's no way. Right. If you respond uh, in a very measured way and you continuously increase the pressure, and we haven't really seen much of that, frankly, over the last two weeks. It's been very, very slow, as we've all said. The goal is to split apart uh, the different groups uh, that Matt described. Uh, so, and you saw it happen over the ambassador bridge uh, over like, these last two days. Yes, with, with threats of arrest and fines, yet a lot of people just left. And then when the police line formed, more people just left. So by the time the final round happened, there was just a small handful of really committed people that were still there, and that was just easier to manage. That's got to be the strategy every time. Um, the reason it's a no-win is if you escalate too quickly, you actually radicalize some of the people, um, and there's long-term consequences from that, especially in an age of social media. If you respond too slowly, uh, you get weak and effectual government. Um, you know, this is a crisis of authority. The civil power is broken down. So you've got, you're, you're looking for a very narrow sweet spot here. Ultimately, Multiple, all levels of government are going to take back those streets. We're not going to be living with this. There really is not much of a threat to the civil power, if we're honest about this. Uh, the real issue with the bridge, that really got people going in Ottawa last week. That one's resolved already. In Alberta, the traffic is going. It's just one lane. That's frustrating. So let's keep a sense of perspective here and use the instruments that we have. It's just really tough on elected officials this kind of moment. And you have to give the prime minister and the cabinet credit. They did not resort in a visceral way uh, to the strongest set of instruments that they have. I think in, in hindsight, Steve, just as um, with the FLQ crisis um, in Montreal, a more measured response would have been better. We'll look back at this and we'll say roughly, <laughs> and we, I acknowledge how slow and frustrating this has been, but roughly they're in the right zone. Uh, we got a minute left here. Let me give 30 seconds to Matt and then 30 seconds to Stephanie on the apparent paper tigerish look of some of our governments right now who seem to be incapable of doing uh, what many people think is required in order to um, show that democracies can cope with situations like this. Matt, go ahead. I'll pick up on what Janice was just saying about <clears throat> having that that kind of the ambassador bridge, right? The the slow peeling away of the different groups, the slow, literally slow advance of the lines of police in to kind of disperse people. You can have slow action on the ground at the tactical level, but I think you need swift and decisive action at the strategic level to get those guys doing those slow de-escalating actions actions a lot faster. You shouldn't wait weeks to initiate your slow action. You should have your slow action going in very quickly. Still calm, still rational, still trying to keep things under control, but you don't let it fester for, for weeks because if there is a threat to the authority of the state, it's the appearance of weakness more than weakness itself. Last 30 to Stephanie. Yeah, it's been deeply frustrating. Uh, you know, we are invoking the Emergencies Act, but, you know, we have criminal statutes that can give people 10 years for just engaging in criminal mischief. It'll be really interesting to see how this plays out, if this is kind of a, a symbolic tool by the federal government to look like it is doing something in an age when we are all kind of screaming, do something to respond. But um, it'll be interesting in the coming days to see how the movement itself responds to this. And, um, you know, I guess what I'm going to be looking for in really the coming months is the conversations we're going to have around policing's 
emergencies and um, you know how we actually respond to a threat that really doesn't seem to have a name other than uh, subversion or possibly sedition. Why do you think that this has become a tried and true template uh, for protesting that we're seeing repeated, you know, in France and in Australia? Well, social movements oftentimes have what we refer to as a repertoire of struggle. And the occupation style struggle, that goes back a long ways. You could go all the way back to 1871 and look at the Paris Commune as an example of this. So occupying a physical space uh, is highly effective in terms of being able to raise awareness about the existence of your grievances, but also to meet other people uh, that you might not be aware of until you actually get together. So in a way, what's happening in Ottawa is kind of like a convention for right-wing populism right now. It's in a way like a meet and greet for people to find each other under this sort of banner of um, freedom and this right to be left alone and this sort of weariness with uh, pandemic restrictions, et cetera. Michael, I'm, I'm curious, you know, because you're in the thick of it, this is, if you look at the numbers, it's a quite a small crowd of people occupying Ottawa right now. Does that play into it as well when we look at the numbers and how easily that could be sort of copied in other countries? Well, absolutely. It is a Canadian style pro, uh, protest. We need to own it. Part of the reason we've had this trouble is that we have thought of it as something that could never happen in Canada. It is a divided population on many questions. When people are able to organize under one banner, in this case, COVID-19 restrictions, you bring together all manner of strange bedfellows. They don't need to be well coordinated. They can arrive in small number with heavy machineries and wreak havoc on the city. And then it attracts a life of its own, like a critical mass. On weekends, you have throngs of casual protesters breezing into town in up to 10,000 at any given moment on the weekend. And then it compresses back down to a very small number of hardcore protesters, around 400 during the business hours of the week. This is a very efficient, extremely disruptive strategy that, of course, people with an interest in pushing an agenda around the planet will capitalize on and attempt to replicate. Michael, the chief of police in your city just resigned over this. Why, did, why does it seem police can't get a handle on this situation? We talk, you know, you talk about the numbers, you talk about the disruption, but, and there's plenty of warning. The police were very much on the back foot, again, in terms of underestimating the threat that was on the way, the disruptive threat. Number two, very much on the back foot because where they have been aggressive in the past, G20 in Toronto about 11 years ago, they reaped all kinds of trouble. They were sued by citizens. They paid out tens of millions of dollars to citizens that had been deemed to be wrongly treated by the courts. They were on the back foot. They thought, okay, everybody's asked us to contain protests, let people have their right to free speech, just mitigate the worst of the damage. Unfortunately, that allowed things to bed in. And once you've got those tons of truck machinery bedded down in the center part of town, very difficult to move if you've got a protest whose objective it is to stay for as long as possible. They weren't here just to make a point and leave town. Anya, I want to come to you. You've obviously done a lot of research on this group. I, I'm curious, how would you describe who makes up this movement? Yeah, there's a real kind of diversity, I think, present. And I think the fact that they are kind of occupying the space for a long period of time allows them to attract a wide variety from people who have legitimate kind of personal and political grievances against the lockdown measures or perhaps against COVID itself. Obviously, many people have lost a lot over the course of this pandemic. Those people, I think, come out on weekends, but um, as my fellow panelists have spoken about, there are also the more kind of entrenched folks um, who perhaps represent more fringe ideologies, more right-wing ideologies. And so we're really seeing a mix of um, people who are harnessing this movement for kind of other um, agendas and then people who really are just looking to express, you know, some of the pain of the last few years. Even more than the sheer number of managers, it's their positioning that is often dysfunctional in organizations. Uh, we had companies in Canada and the US 
that are large, and so they justify a certain number of managers, but they tend to be arranged vertically. So you have companies that have 10, 12, 14 layers of hierarchy. That means that what managers do on a day-to-day -day basis is seek approval up and down this vertical line of authority. And that means uh, endless meetings, uh, the necessity to you know, navigate all these levels and all these uh, lines of reporting. You can imagine repositioning these managers more horizontally, where an organization creates parts of the uh, work of the company that are more decentralized, more independent, and where you still need managerial oversight and guidance, but it is arranged more along horizontal lines instead of being stacked up vertically. Okay, this more kind on that. of redistribution would improve dramatically the use of the managerial ranks that exist. Understood. More on that to come. Dave Ulrich, how about you? Are there too many managers out there? I think it's the wrong question. You know, the clothes that we wear, the, the headsets we have, the books that we have, everything we eat, our lives, are given to us by an organization. How do you build an organization that takes individual competencies and creates an organizational capability? Management is one way to do that. It's not the only way. If you replace management, you've got to find other ways to make sure that that organization delivers value. So for me, the question is, how do you create a governance system so that the organization accomplishes its purpose? It could be through incentives, pay. It could be through bureaucracy, which is the argument that Michaela and Gary Hamill have made brilliantly. Or it could be through shared values. But the issue is not how many managers do we have. The issue is how do you create an organization that makes sure that those books that Tatiana publishes get published? And uh, how do you create an organization that makes sure that Steve's show stays on the air? That's the question I'm interested in. That's a question I'm interested in, too. No, never mind. We're going to move on from that. Dan Bresnitz, your take on whether we have, uh, with apologies to Dave, I'm going to ask the question again, too many managers out there. Again, uh, I actually have to agree with Dave. Um, I'm not sure that we have too many managers out there. I think that what uh, Tatiana and um, Michaela have described is correct. We currently have too many layers of management, which the only thing that they do is managing the manager, but managing the manager. How do we manage without managers? So because the work of managing, you know, of getting things done, uh, as, as, as Dave mentioned, uh, efficiently at scale is important. That will never go away. But can we think, can we imagine organizations that can do that? Um, and 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 be less hierarchical, be less managerially focused, and 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 filled with 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 managers who are not adding a ton of value, you know, and and probably not very happy in in playing that role, right? So, and 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 and, and we think that the answer is yes, and we, we arrived at those estimates that 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 you mentioned um, by looking at organizations that are able to be uh, capable, much more capable, much more efficient, much more innovative, with a fraction of the managerial footprint of, of, um, of traditionally uh, managed companies. So Tiziana mentioned you know, large, large firms with 12, 12 layers of management. Some of the companies that we've researched, and perhaps we can get into some of them later, but like for instance, Hire, which is the largest appliance maker in the world, or Bertzer, which is the largest provider of home health services in the Netherlands, they manage workforces of tens of thousands of people with you know two layers of management, not 12. I think that black joy allows for black people to really be in their element, whatever that looks like to them, whatever that sounds like, really getting to know um, their inner self and getting to express themselves however they choose um, in order to create um, things that the public can enjoy and that other people can learn from. Alexandra, what would you add to that? I would add that Black Joy um, exists in the smallest moments and the biggest movements. Black Joy is um, a response to oppression, um, and um, it is something that we, as Black people, hold sacred. Um, and we we can share it with with strangers. We can share it with family members. 
um, Black Joy is is sort of our life's blood. Rochelle. Sure, absolutely. I, I, I love what everyone has said so far. Black Joy is really understanding where you're from, understanding your history, but but living in your present and looking forward to the future as well and, and enjoying all the diversity that Black Joy has, Black culture. It's not a, a monolith, though, and, and a lot of joy comes from different things. And then really relishing and loving who you are and and how you experience all the different and beautiful elements of black culture. Rochelle, let me do a quick follow-up with you because part of your answer said, looking forward to the future. And obviously mm -hmm. a lot of what has transpired, particularly over the last few years, has been, has been miserable and unhappy and difficult. And, mm -hmm. and none of it has sort of pointed to a looking forward to a more optimistic and positive future. At least mm -hmm. you, could, you can interpret it that way. So again, talk to us about the importance of, of looking forward to a better future and how that works into all of this. Sure. I mean, after everything that's happened, after really the world woke up to what Black people have been experiencing for generations, um, so much has changed, I think. I mean, there's way more that to be done, but organizations are looking at policies. They're looking at things through an equity lens. Um, there have been some movement in trying to... Um, you know, help, I guess, even the, the playing field. And so looking forward to the future for me is really looking at um, how we can evolve and develop and bring Black joy into our lives. And yes, acknowledge the trauma, but really get out of that situation. All right, Alexandra, let's look at some of your contribution to this issue. And that is, I want to talk about a play you did called Finding Black Joy, which people can watch if they go onto the Grand Theatre website. It is there through the end of February. Um, start us off. What's the play about? So the 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 I don't I don't know if it's a play. It's it's this compilation of events um, that sort of take you from the bottom, the depths of the hardest parts of being black, which is racism. It confronts racism in a very um, truth telling way and then moves you to this um, concert, which is an expression of black joy. And you, you can't really get to black joy without understanding the, the, the pressures being faced by the black uh, community. Um, and so it's, it's this wonderful truth-telling piece that involves um, as many black people as I could fit into it. And, um, and, and yeah, it's, 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 I don't know, it's one of my greatest works. Noelle, you know, there are many terms out there, body positivity, size inclusivity, <clears throat> excuse me, body neutrality. What do they mean and why should we be careful uh, when choosing the right terminology? Well, these are words that have emerged as uh, part of a time where we're trying to say, let's get away from hunger being the enemy. Let's get away from BMI being something that we define ourselves as or weight on the scale. Let's instead embrace these beautiful bodies that we have that can come in different sizes. When we think about body positivity, it's being positive towards the body. It's not saying, oh, I'm so bad for eating this or I'm being good today. Since when are we a good or bad person based on the shape of our body or based on what was on our plate or in a bowl? There's so much more. And so if we can just step back and say, let's love our body. Let's be good to our body that gets us through the day that has just got us through a pandemic. That is a beautiful thing. Let's step away from making these restrictive choices or making someone feel poorly about themselves because of what they ate or what their body size is. And if we can move forward with this, if we can raise our next generation uh, behind us and, and those behind them to have these new opinions of numbers and of the body and even of age, as David has been talking about, we can actually see an emergence of beautiful relationship with food, with hunger, with satiety, with our bodies, with our age. This can be a beautiful thing, and we can just erase the diet industry altogether, as far as I'm concerned. They do not need our money anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Marnie, um, you know, your products, uh, your Arna garments are size inclusive. What does that mean? 
So size inclusivity means represented, representative of the population and the customers that we serve. So for Thigh Society, we offer our chafing undergarments in a size extra small to a size 6XL. Not what you might typically see or the stereotype of chafing being a plus size issue where we might only offer uh, a certain size range. And I think, you know, back to the comments about body positive, there have been a lot of brands in the last couple of years that have wanted to sort of jump on that body positive bandwagon because it was a trending hashtag and it was really trendy to say that you were body positive. And then they would turn around and either not offer their whole size range or their, their, not offer their whole products in the full size range or not show body diverse models uh, on their website and in their socials. And I think it's really important, not only from a size perspective, but from a racial perspective, you know, from an age perspective, all the things we've been talking about. We live in a diverse society. And I think if, if brands want to um, be compelling and have their customers appreciate them and know that they're they're trying to do better for society overall, for all of our mental health and wellness, the more you can be inclusive in your marketing and advertising, it's just smart business. It just makes sense for the overall good of society as well. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find the full conversations on our website, tbo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's all for this Friday, February 18th, 2022. Monday, we return to our conversation with former Conservative Member of Parliament, Lisa Raitt, on facing her husband's early onset Alzheimer's. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thank you for watching TBO and for joining us online at tbo.org. Have a great family day weekend and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.